it's a pleasure for me to um, to introduce our second speaker. Um, Andrew um, uh, is um, Andrew speaking with us was arranged um, through AMP, and I'd like to thank um, AMP very much for um, for uh, speaking initially with Andrew and for making it possible for him to speak with us today. As, as you all know, the oldest profession um, is currently in lockdown mode. Um, and so I've gone to the second oldest profession um, to, to look at uh, what we can learn in advice from, um, uh, from a profession for whom ethics have been an absolutely central part of the way in which business has been conducted. Um, so, uh, a profession that's learned to take um, this extremely seriously. Um, and so today's session, um, and I'll hand over to Andrew now, is, is lessons from another profession which we might apply ourselves. Andrew, thanks very much. Thanks, Toby, and it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Thank you very much for your time. I will just um, bring up some slides. Um, there we go. Thank you. So Toby mentioned um, law being the second oldest profession. I think that's a, a claim to fame that many professions have had over the years. I think Ronald Reagan once said of politics that it was it had been suggested to him that that politics was the second oldest profession, but that it bore a lot of resemblance to the first. And um, probably the same has been said about us lawyers as well over time. Um, I am going to go through a little bit of history today. I promise to make it um, as entertaining and um, brief as possible, but I think it is important and, and relevant for you to understand the context in which, I guess, uh, legal ethics has evolved. And I think that um, that will give you a picture of just how challenging what's ahead of you as an industry is um, and what you're being asked to do um, and how that compares with how, how the legal industry has shaped itself and, and evolved over time. Right. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time on this concept of what is, what does professional mean? Now the word professional comes from the Latin to profess, which means to, um, to, to claim to have a certain level of skill or, or, or to profess to have a certain level of skill. And it was really used in the first instance in the second, about the 16th century to denote the special occupations of medicine, law, the divinity, and in some cases, the military. Um, they were what were called the so-called learned professions, if you like. However, much of the population used the term to refer to everything from barbering to butchering, which really is something not much has changed in the last 400 years in that, in that respect. So I want to touch on that. I think there's really three ways um, that you can define what a professional is. Um, the first is someone who's paid for their services. And before I was a lawyer, I was a professional musician. And um, by that, I mean that I played in front of reluctant friends and family. And as you say on the, see on the screen there, once received a check from Afro and Amcos for 12 cents for um, one of my band songs being played at some point, at some time that I didn't hear. So, you know, is that a professional? Well, I would suggest possibly not. The next level is, um, the second definition I'll throw at you is a person who's achieved a certain level of skill. Now, again, that's something that absolutely is essential to what we think of as professional services, but it's something that could be said of almost anyone that's worked in a job for long enough. Um, so why is it that the term professional attaches to only the select few, what we call professions. What is it that's different? I think the difference really is in the value that's provided. And I guess if I can draw a distinction between a professional and a technician, a technician is someone who has deep knowledge and understanding and can do something very, very well the first time. What a professional brings that a technician perhaps doesn't bring is judgment. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of a professional. Now, this is just my list, not necessarily any sort of official list. Um, I'll let you have a look and reflect on that slide there. The, the top row there is what I would consider and what I would what I'll call today our ticket to play. They are the things that to my mind are absolutely essential for a professional. Now the bad news for you in this, those things also are not particularly valued in the sense of they are assumed and, and they are absolutely baseline. Um, every law firm in town will tell you that they have the technical knowledge to do the job and every um, client that comes to me to give me work doesn't, generally doesn't come to me because they think I've got more technical knowledge than the other 
superannuation and financial services professional who you know has also been working at this for 20 years. Um, equally, integrity and trust, absolutely core to what we do as professionals and lawyers, equally the same for you. Putting our clients' interests first, you, know, you have a statutory duty to act in the interests of your clients. Um, we don't have a statutory duty, we have fiduciary obligations. Um, fourthly, I'd say uh, having that um, continuous hunger to get better and to continuously learn and develop. Now, the good news for me as a financial services professional and for you is that there's always things to learn. Uh, the learning never stops and that's part of what is so fulfilling about being a professional services provider. Um, but it is absolutely, again, essential and assumed that you do that. And fifthly, uh, you see the handcuffs there, uh, professionals need to be accountable. And I'll talk a little bit about how that has evolved um, in the legal profession. Um, but clearly we're all accountable in that respect as well. Now, this, the second row here on my slide is really what I would classify as some of the, the what do you do's. So, you know, you, deliver, you provide insight, you deliver out, outside of the box thinking, you provide perspective, a good communicator. These are some of the things that do set some professionals apart from others. And then third row there is, I guess, kind of the how. It's, you know, how do you deliver what you're doing? And it's things like being flexible, being focused on the relationship, being collaborative in the way that you work, being committed to sustainable ways of working and, and being respectful. Respectful means a lot of things, um, but I guess that, that I would put into that bucket just the very nature of, you know, what we call um, being professional in the sense of, you know, dressing professionally, carrying yourself in a certain way, being calm, being the voice of reason, and all of those sorts of things. That's, that's the how. So I mentioned history. I'm going to talk briefly about the, the history of legal profession. I'm going to condense about 3,000 years of history down to one slide, and I promise that it will not take 3,000 years to get through. So the earliest um, people that could claim really to be lawyers were probably the ancient Greeks. Now, ancient Greek orators were um, often called upon to take take the cause of, of another um, in, in a dispute. What was interesting about the ancient Greeks is that there was a rule that people had to either present their own case or have a friend present that case and the friend could never charge for their services. So the legal profession as it was in those days, some 3,000 years ago, was a bunch of people at least pretending not to be paid for their services. Um, and they had to uphold that legal fiction that they were just an ordinary citizen generously helping out a friend for free. And they were never able to organize into what we call a real profession. Now, if I fast forward about a thousand years to the Roman Empire, Emperor Claudius legalized the legal profession in a proper sense, and then even allowed lawyers to charge a limited fee for their service. So thank you, Emperor Claudius. However, um, Roman lawyers could only charge a prescribed fee that was set by the emperor, and it was simply not enough money for lawyers to make a living. This may sound eerily familiar to you at this point. Um, by around the fourth century, lawyers had to be enrolled in the bar of a court to argue before it, and there were restrictions on how many people could be enrolled in the court. Uh, in, in around 460, Emperor Leo imposed the requirement that new advocates seeking admission had to produce testimonials from their teachers, and by about the sixth century, a regular course of legal study lasting about four years was required for admission. So you see that around about 1400 years ago, we had the framework of you know, professional requirements being imposed on the legal industry. Now, um, so I mentioned, I mentioned the difficulty of being paid, which was that one there. Um, then we hit the dark ages. So around the 12th century, um, Western Europe, no one in Western Europe could probably be described as a professional lawyer at that time. This is the point at which the legal profession really had um, its, its um, most difficult moment and, and where a lot of the legal the jokes we hear about lawyers um, probably found their origins is in that in the 12th century. And so there was a renewed effort at that time from the church and state to regulate lawyers and bring the practice of law up to a professional standard. And so, you know, um, that's the point at which we saw a trend towards professionalization um, statutes being enacted that prescribed accountability punishment for lawyers who are guilty of deceit and um, you know regulations concerning admission procedures and the administering of an oath to promise to do certain things so that's where fiduciary obligation really 
finds its home around the 12th century. And then fast forward another 800 years and there we are, the lawyers of today. There's Lionel Hutsui, um, who I hope I'm never compared to again. Now, I, I, I drag you through that to compare that timeline to what the financial services and what the financial advice industry is going through. So we are around about 12 years on now from some high profile collapses. The Olco Financial and Storm Financial were really triggers for um, review of the system and what ultimately became FOFRA, the FOFRA regulations and, and legislation which commenced in 1 July 2013. Obviously that's where we had the best interest duty, conflicted remuneration rules, um, grandfathering of commissions, and you know, and and the rest. We then fast forward to 2017 with the Professional Standards Act, ASIC Report 515. We move on to you know, only last year, CPD requirements come in, and the exam, the FASIA exam for new advisors, professional standards kicking in July of last year, so less than a year ago. Code of Ethics came in as of this year, and uh, you know, existing advisors will be required to sit an exam next year, and then professional accreditation will be in a few years time. So to sum all that up, you as an industry are required to do in roughly 10 years what took us about 800. And what is largely different about that is we did a lot of it ourselves. We, uh, the legal industry was largely self-regulated, whereas this is being imposed by statute and something that the, the financial planning industry needs to kind of come to grips with. So I'll just talk a little bit about the, the FASIA Code of Ethics and how that sort of aligns. And I must say, I came up with my slide here of the, the qualities of a professional, the characteristics of a professional, and then went and looked at the code of ethics. And I was interested to see just how they align. And obviously, I focus in particular on that top row, that ticket to play that I mentioned. So there's 12 standards in that FASIA code of ethics. First one being you know, acting in accordance with applicable law and not trying to circumvent the intent. Um, acting in integrity in the best interest of your clients, number two, and three, you know, not advising in a manner where you have a conflict of interest or duty. So that's really, you know, that technical knowledge, integrity and trust, putting your client's interest first will come through in those first three. Um, standard, the standards four, five, and six are about client care, you know, act for a client only with the client's free, prior and informed consent. Um, standard five, Recommendations have to be in the best interest of the client, so that's putting the client's interest first. Number six, take into account the broad effects. That's really that insight and perspective coming in. Then seven, eight, and nine are around quality processes. Standard seven, again, free and informed consent to any fees and services. Eight, keeping records. Nine, all advice that you give must be offered in good faith. I think that, again, ties in with putting client's interest first. Then as we move to 10, 11, and 12, it's about maintaining and applying high level of skills and knowledge, a little bit of technical knowledge. Again, that continuous learning is an express focus. Cooperating with ASIC in any investigation, there's our accountability coming in. And then 12, individually and in cooperation with peers, you must uphold the standards of the profession. So an element of collaboration there, as well as some of the other things we've touched on. So you can see there, that the FASIA standards do tie in quite well with, with my list there and, and definitely tick off all of those things that I would call a minimum ticket to play. Now, if I tie that in with your industry, it is a minimum ticket to play that you comply moving forward with this code of ethics. And those things, whilst they are the bedrock of what you need to do, they are not the things that are going to differentiate you from your peers. They are the things that just need to become business as usual the things that just you live and breathe and, and we need to look to deliver value to our clients by doing more than those things. And that's where some of those other boxes perhaps come, come into it. Martin talked a little bit about client experience, which I think is rel relevant to this conversation as well. Another really interesting parallel for me between the legal industry and the financial planning industry is, is I reflect on the different challenges facing our industries. They're actually quite similar. Um, both of our industries are under ex extreme pressure to reduce our pricing or to you know, deliver more for less. Um, both of our industries are um, experiencing disruption and new entrants coming in, technology driving um, changes in the way that we work, but also introducing opportunities for new people to, to try and disrupt and, 
you know, we keep hearing that the lawyers are going to take over from, a, uh, sorry, that robots are going to take over from the lawyers. Um, once again, I'd say judgment is at the core of what is being a professional, and that's something that we, we are still yet to create a bot that's able to do. Um, sustainability is becoming more and more of an issue, and I don't mean that just in sense, in sense of environmental pressures but as a legal profession one of the, the great challenges we've had has been around gender balance and it may seem like a little bit of lip service because you see all of the law firms touting their um, partner promotes and talking about the, the number of women that we're promoting but there is a really a couple of really really core um, aspects to this from a business perspective one is over 65 percent of our lawyers are women so we are only as successful as the talent that we attract and that we retain. And if we do not create pathways for those really bright, talented young people to become partners in law firms, then we just won't attract them in the first place and we won't be able to compete. And I was saying on the slide there, the war for talent. That is really key. Um, and secondly, our clients judge us on that. Um, if we do not um, demonstrate a commitment to gender equality, then we will find that clients look elsewhere and we have had instances where general counsels have said to us i'm not willing to work with a team that does not have an adequate gender balance so there is a financial cost in that sense as well so i, I put all of that into the sustainability bucket um, increased regulation again you guys are going through this we are going through this as well and the legal profession has been um, heavily scrutinized over the last 30 years or so in particular in this country and there's been a number of reviews a number of increases in the what in the uh, level of ethical obligations and and uh, legal obligations that are imposed on lawyers. Community expectations obviously ramping up. War for talent point I've touched on, but that's a really interesting one too because as I as I sit here now, we actually have four generations of lawyers working together um, in our well not in our offices but in our organisation, and it is extremely challenging to cater to all of those different types of individuals and you would be experiencing this too not just from a talent retention standpoint but and as martin touched on in terms of your client base as well we as martin said cannot ignore millennials for us millennials make up a huge proportion of our workforce and of our future leaders and we absolutely have to um, harness what they bring to the table as well i'm going to talk a little bit of law and I promise not too much today we'll keep it light um, I, I was asked to just touch on well, what, what is this whole fiduciary obligation what does that mean and there's a there's a legal answer to this and there's a practical one in terms of the fiduciaries and best interest duties and, and I won't get into this a lot of detail because this is this is an hour on its own but what's really important to understand about fiduciary obligations is that they are proscriptive not prescriptive duties and what we mean by that is they are duties to not do something um, fiduciary obligations essentially boil down to two things, the no profit rule and the no conflict rule. And what that means is no profit rule is I have a duty to not obtain an unauthorized benefit from my relationship with my client. So in other words, I can be paid, but it must be fully informed consent. I can't receive benefits that the client is not aware of and has not consented to. And secondly, the no conflict rule duty. I have a duty not to put myself in a position of conflict. Now, conflicts are inevitable. And there are different types of conflicts that we deal with. But managing conflicts is absolutely core and again, baseline business practice for lawyers and now for you as well. I'll touch a little bit on conflict. So we see it as there's actually two types of conflicts. We have what we call a conflict of duty and a conflict of interest. And what we typically think of as a conflict is really a conflict of interest. That is, I am giving advice, but I have a personal interest in the outcome. That's a, that's a conflict of interest. There are conflict between my duty to my client and the interest of my client and my personal interests. Those ones are the ones that are, you know, we're, we're more used to seeing and more used to dealing with and saying, well, that can be potentially managed through um, disclosure or by, a, you know, stepping out of a particular decision and all, all sorts of things. Those are, that, those are ones I'm probably more familiar with. Conflicts of duty, though, arise a lot for us as lawyers and are very, very challenging. And I, I just invite you to think about this. A conflict of duty arises where you have a duty to one person that conflicts with the duty to another. So for example, if my firm of 280 partners and 2000 lawyers, whatever it is, gets asked to act for a client that is negotiating with another client and gets asked by the other client to also act for them, we have ourselves a conflict of duty. 
Now, we have um, processes and mechanisms in place to potentially be able to take those instructions in some cases, but quite a lot of the time, the only proper and appropriate answer is for us to decline the instructions from one of those clients. And the reason for that is because as lawyers, we have a duty to bring all of the, the knowledge of the firm to that relationship and to that client. So for example, if some other partner in another part of the business knows that um, this, you know, that the other side in a negotiation is willing to give on A, B, and C, I'm expected to know that as well. And I'm expected to use that information for the benefit of my client. That's what my fiduciary obligation requires. So therefore, you know, oftentimes in those circumstances, the only thing to do is to decline one of the instructions. So we need to be judicious about what we do. We need to be focused always on our client's interests and not, not on necessarily getting as much work as we possibly can. Um, for us also, we break, we break conflicts into um, commercial conflicts and legal conflicts. A really interesting example of that is we have a litigator in my firm that is renowned for his work in assisting the government with the uh, Royal Commission into the trade unions. And off the back of that work, he was asked to assist the government in the Royal Commission, again, um, the Financial Services Royal Commission. Now, as you can imagine, that would have been an extremely um, profitable role for us to take on. But many, many partners in the place, and I was not a partner at the time, but I was screaming as loud as one, were saying, we cannot possibly, in all good conscience, take that role and expect that our clients will still be there for us when we come back 12 months, two years later, and the Royal Commission is over. It, it will look like um, absolute suicide, even though we didn't have a legal conflict. There is a commercial matter there. It's just, you know, how can our clients have trust in us if we were going to be helping the government with that review? Um, so you sometimes have to make those hard decisions. Um, I won't dwell on the best interest duty, but what's interesting to understand there is there is a distinction between your fiduciary obligations and the best interest duty. The fiduciary obligations arise because of position of power. So where a person um, is in the position to make decisions or to give, you know, or is in a position of superior knowledge that puts the other person at risk, that's where fiduciary obligations arise. So doctor, patient, lawyer, client, now advisor, client as well. And that's where the proscriptive duties come in. Do not do no harm if you like. The best interest duty is something more. Or the best interest duty is about, in a, in a way, it's, it's linked to the, to the duty to not be in a position of conflict, but it's about putting the client's interests ahead of your own. It's about inputs, about who you are thinking about when you make a decision, not about what you achieve by making that decision. Now, what's interesting about that, just as an aside, is the industry obviously grappled with that when it came in and demanded that um, the government be more prescriptive and just have a best interest duty. Now, product issuers like superannuation trustees and uh, managed, managed investment scheme, REs, are used to this concept of the best interest duty and it's, it's in the law and there's nothing sort of qualifying it from there. But in the advice space, we have what we call the safe harbour. And that is um, in the Corporations Act, it provides that the best interest duty will be satisfied if an advisor does seven, seven things. And I won't go through those in any detail, but they're all about following a process. So it's identifying the objectives, financial situations and needs of the client, identifying the subject matter of the advice, working out what the relevant circumstances are and so on and so on. That's all about, in my view, exercising due care, skill and diligence in carrying out the advice. None of the safe harbour tests actually go to what the best interest duty is about, which is about putting the client's interest ahead of your own. So what I want to just leave you with on that point is to say the safe harbour confuses the duty and you should have your mind on the duty. The duty is to put the client's interests first. It doesn't mean necessarily obtaining the best outcome. It is about inputs, not outcomes. However, having said that, of course, you have to be a real, realist and realise that when, you are, um, when it's considered you know, by a court or by a regular as to whether you acted in the best interest of the client, we always look with the benefit of hindsight and with the benefit of hindsight, it, it can be that outcomes drive whether or not something is, is raised in the first place and, and tested. So, you know, we have to live in, a, in, the, in the real world. Um, but the courts have held consistently that it is about inputs and not outcomes. 
Now, I mentioned continuous learning. Obviously, we've got a lot more regulation on the way. Um, design and distribution obligations are due to come in soon. The financial executive accountability regime, they're calling FAR, we're calling FEAR, um, is close at hand as well. Um, although it's being introduced for APRA regulated entities at first, the plan that the government announced was to introduce it for all AFS licensees, which means it will apply to the financial planning industry as well. I'll just whiz through this from here. So I talked about distinguishing ourselves and, and, and the values of a professional being, being core, things like ethics and technical expertise. So how do we stand out from the crowd? And this is something that Minters have done a lot of work on in recent times. We believe that the commercial success of our business is entirely dependent on being clear about who we are and what we stand for. This is all about being a purpose-led organization. We think that providing technical advice and being a trusted advisor, you know, having integrity is just a ticket to play. It's nothing more than that. It's what every firm says that they do. And the way that we set ourselves apart is by being purpose-led and by how we do what we do, not by what we do. So this slide explains what we regard as doing things in the Mitchell Ellison way. Okay, now we have done a lot of work with our, with our people to work out what it is that really Minters is about. And I say this with Minters has, is a firm that's been around for 200 years and we have a firm um, history of challenging the status quo. We, we actually acted for um, one of the most prominent Aboriginal businessmen in Australia some 200 years ago, um, which really was the foundation of, of our business. Um, we have always been about being curious and innovative. We've always been about being authentic and building endurance during relationships with our clients. And I won't take you through that slide, but that gives you a sense of what it is that we perceive as the Mitchellism way. Now, why is that important? I'm talking about purposes. All perhaps sounds like a bit of mumbo jumbo to you. I'll just leave you with this. Establishing culture within your organization is absolutely central to some of the things Martin talked about, about client experience. Culture drives behavior, behavior drives action, and actions reinforce culture. We have a staff of 2,000 people, and we are trying to make all of those people run through the wall for our clients. We don't do that by saying, we pay the most money, or we're the best, come and work for us, because then it's all about what you can get out of it. You know, what, what the trans it's a transactional relationship. We say to our people, we believe in making a difference. We believe in making life, of creating lasting impacts with our clients, our people, and our communities. And we hire people who ascribe to those beliefs. And by doing that, we ensure that we have a consistent approach to delivering on client expectations. And, and our actions, our culture drives our actions, and our actions in turn reinforce our culture. And we think that the same is true of any professional services firm. Now, I, I'll just leave you, I'm sure that you've all heard of Simon Sinek. I invite you to have a look at Simon's talk, Start With Why, and the importance of being purpose-led in a professional organisation. Um, and I will stop there and pause for questions. Look, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. That was uh, great. And I really, I really enjoyed um, uh, your presentation and your, your broad overview of issues of, of ethics and, and purpose. Um, I guess one of the questions for me in that is, um, you, you mentioned 2,000 people, and for, for most of the people on this call, um, that's significantly more than, than yes. the number of people in their organisations. Um, it must pose some real challenges um, in trying to uh, not suppress personality while nonetheless uh, achieve commonality of culture. I mean, in a practical sense, how does Mintus go about that? that that's absolutely right. And, and I, I mentioned the size of the organisation to, to explain, I guess, the, the level of challenge. It, it is obviously um, easier to get your arms around a smaller organisation, but the same challenges exist. Um, we encourage our people to bring their whole selves to work. We are very passionate about that because... Frankly, we ask people to work very, very hard and you cannot ask people to work very, very hard um, without engaging with who they are as people and really valuing who they are as people and, and having a purpose that is aligned to what their own personal purposes are. So um, 
absolutely, you know, we do not want to um, squash individuality. And you can see here, you know, uh, you've got a partner in a law firm showing showing photos of himself from from you know being in bands back in the day, where else we very much value um, that aspect of all the people that work for us, and and we hope that they can harness that and turn that into really um, positive experiences for clients and having that human interaction with clients. Um, there's a question here from uh, from David um, uh, about the percentage of the work which minters do, which is uh, pro bono. Um, yep. So that's a, a that's a good good question, and, and I talked about increasing regulation of the legal profession. The legal profession is actually required by law to do at least fifteen percent pro bono work. Um, Minters far out um, shoots that target every year. We have um, a dedicated pro bono practice. We have um, a series of partners that work exclusively in pro bono work, and um, some of the things that we do um, focus on is. Um, the Homeless Persons Legal Centre in Sydney is a good example. We do grow quite a lot of work with the Aboriginal community, particularly in, in Northern Queensland and the Northern Territory. Um, did, did you say 15% of, of time on... It's a statutory requirement, yes. So that's a sixth, so that's uh, just, that is uh, just under a day a week. Um, yeah. Uh, that is a very significant... Um, uh, that yep. is a very significant commitment. Yeah. Uh, now, so w just back to the point about sort of the inculcation of of, of culture. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, you say that you drive your people hard, and I mean that that's sort of a widely understood view, I believe. Um, uh, that presumably leads to relatively high turnover at an at an early stage. I mean. Uh, my, my son's a chef, as many people will know, um, which is also a, a, an industry that, or a trade that drives its um, people hard. Um, their problem is turnover. Um, yep. How does that play out in, in the law? That is, that is exactly the same challenge we have. Um, gone are the days of, you know, people expecting to work for one organisation for, you know, 15 and 20 years, although I've been at Minters almost 15 years now and um, was at one of the big four banks for seven years before that, but um, gone are the days where that's normal. And I've had many a uh, young lawyer ask to, you know, have coffee or something and ask me, well, why, why are you here? Why have you done this? What, this doesn't make sense. I just don't understand. Um, so that is very much at the center of, you know, being purpose led, I think is, is as I say, we need to engage um, with, that aspect of the workforce and we have to recognize as say millennials are probably two thirds of our workforce now and they are you know they are a much more mobile um generation than than my generation was and um the only way to really connect with them in a way that is lasting and real is to um buy into you know their, their beliefs and their purpose and to invest in them as as people and not see them as a commodity or a bum on a seat um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time trying to understand who, are, who our people are and what's important to them. And we also spend a lot of time trying to um, make sure that we hire people who are, you know, who believe in the same things we believe and that, that you know, will invest in us because they believe and they have shared values. Look, Andrew, thank you very much for your time. And to all of you who've, uh, who've attended today's uh, session, thank you for your participation. Um, this has been a really interesting process for us to take what was a day of, of work and try and turn it into a series of succinct um, presentations. Um, I've enjoyed the process and, and I know I've got a lot of value um, out, of, out of this. Um, tomorrow, um, in the final um, sessions, uh, we'll have Chris Wrightson and uh, Nick Avery from uh, Ironbark and uh, Finclear respectively talking about um, how advice practices um, have actually implemented um, uh, portfolios, uh, managed accounts in their business. We'll have David Bassanasi, um, who will be well known to many of you um, as, as a very clear thinking economist, um, talking about his view of, um, of the investment uh, framework that we are currently operating in. And that's actually then um, the entree 
to our final session, both for the day and for the whole of this roadshow, um, which is Lucas de Bay and Shane Hawke, two of the most experienced portfolio managers um, throughout the whole of the advice uh, profession, talking about governance um, within a managed account context. So at a time of significant turmoil, um, which David uh, Bassanacy will describe and characterise, um, we'll then have Lucas and Shane, who both have more than two decades of experience um, in building portfolios, in managing the process, um, and in thinking about issues of governance, talking about how those issues, governance, process, um, skill set, uh, come together um, in building uh, managed account uh, programs. So to Andrew and to Martin today, thank you very much for your time. Um, to those of you who've attended, thank you for your attendance, and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thanks very much.